Brought to you by wikivd.com The Room Film The Room is a 2003 American independent romantic drama film starring, written, directed and produced by Tommy Wiseau. The film is primarily centered on a melodramatic love triangle among an amiable banker named Johnny, his deceptive fiancé Lisa and his conflicted best friend Mark. A significant portion of the film is dedicated to a series of unrelated subplots, most of which involve at least one supporting character and are unresolved due to the film's inconsistent narrative structure. According to Wisu, the title alludes to the potential of a room to be the site of both good and bad events. Sestero has elaborated on this by noting that the stage play script from which the film's screenplay is derived takes place in a single room. Sestero has also noted that the film is semi-autobiographical in nature and attempts to serve as an advisory warning about the perils of having friends. Ros Moran, an assistant professor of film studies at Street Cloud State University in Minnesota, described the Room 2 Entertainment Weekly as the Citizen Kane of bad movies. A number of publications have labeled it as one of the worst films ever made. Originally shown only in a limited number of California theaters, The Room quickly became a cult film due to its bizarre and unconventional storytelling and various technical and narrative flaws. Although Wisu has retrospectively characterized the film as a black comedy, audiences have generally viewed it as a poorly made drama of viewpoints supported by some of the film's cast. Sestira's memoir of the making of The Room The Disaster Artist was published in 2013 to critical acclaim, a film based on the book directed by James Franco is scheduled for release on December 1, 2017. Additionally, the film inspired an unofficial video game adaptation titled The Room Tribute, which was released on Newgrounds in 2010. Plot Johnny is a successful banker who lives in a San Francisco townhouse with Lisa his fiance. Lisa, however, having become dissatisfied with her life and Johnny seduces his best friend Mark, and the two begin a secret affair. As the wedding date approaches and Johnny's influence at his bank slips, Lisa alternates between glorifying and vilifying Johnny to her family and friends, both making false accusations of domestic abuse and defending Johnny against criticisms. Meanwhile, Johnny, having overheard Lisa confess her infidelity to her mother, attaches a tape recorder to their phone in an attempt to identify her lover, Denny. A neighboring student whom Johnny financially and emotionally supports has a run-in with an armed drug dealer named Chris R., whom Johnny and Mark overpower and take into custody. Denny also lusts after Lisa ultimately confessing to Johnny his attraction. Johnny slowly begins spiraling into a mental haze and calls upon Peter his and Mark's psychologist friend. Peter alternates between defending Lisa and assessing her as a sociopath which results in Mark briefly trying to murder him at a surprise birthday party for Johnny. One of his friends catches Lisa kissing Mark while the rest of the guests are outside and confronts her about the affair. Johnny announces to the guests that he and Lisa are expecting a child only for Lisa to tell the other guests that she lied about it. At the end of the evening Lisa flaunts her affair in front of Johnny who attacks Mark. After the party Johnny locks himself in the bathroom prompting Lisa to carry out leaving him. For Mark, Johnny finally comes out of the bathroom and retrieves the cassette recorder he attached to the phone and listens to an intimate call between Lisa and Mark. Johnny has an emotional breakdown destroying his apartment and committing suicide via gunshot. Hearing the commotion Denny, Mark and Lisa rush up the stairs to find his body. Mark and Denny blame Lisa for Johnny's death with Mark abandoning her. Denny asks Lisa and Mark to leave, 
but they stay and comfort one another as the police arrive. Inconsistencies and narrative flaws In addition to being rife with continuity errors the film has several plots, subplots, and character details whose inconsistencies have been commented on by critics and audiences. The Portland Mercury has stated that a number of plot threads are introduced, then instantly abandoned, in an early scene. Halfway through a conversation about planning a birthday party for Johnny, Claudette off-handedly tells Lisa, I got the results of the test back. I definitely have breast cancer. The issue is casually dismissed and never revisited, during the rest of the film. In addition, the audience never learns the details surrounding Denny's drug-related debt to Chris or what led to their violent confrontation on the roof. Beyond being Johnny's friend, Mark's background receives no exposition. When he is first introduced he claims to be very busy, while sitting in a parked car in the middle of the day with no explanation ever given as to his occupation or what he was doing. Greg Sestero stated in his memoir The Disaster Artist that he created a backstory for the character in which Mark was an undercover vice detective which Sestero felt united several otherwise disparate aspects of Mark's character. However, Wisu dismissed adding any reference to Mark's past to the script. The makers of the Room video game would later introduce a similar idea as part of a subplot involving Mark's unexplained backstory much to Sestero's amusement. At one point, the principal male characters congregate in an alley behind Johnny's apartment to play catch with a football while wearing tuxedos. When Mark arrives he is revealed to have shaved his beard, and the camera slowly zooms in on his face while dramatic music plays on the soundtrack. Nothing that is said or occurs during the scene has any effect on the plot. The scene ends abruptly when the men decide to return to Johnny's apartment after Peter trips. Wasu received enough questions about the scene that he decided to address it on AQ. Though Wasu only states that playing football without the proper protective equipment is fun and challenging. Greg Sestero has been questioned about the significance of Mark's shaving though his only response for several years was if only he knew. Sestero describes in The Disaster Artist that Wisu insisted he shave his beard on set just so that Wisu would have an excuse for Johnny to call Mark Babyface Wisu's own nickname for Sestero and that the revealing of beardless Mark would be a moment. Sestero further detailed how the football in Tuxedo's scene was concocted on set by Wisu who never explained the significance of the scene to the cast or crew, and insisted that the sequence be filmed at the expense of other relevant scenes. Development The Room originated as a play completed by Wasu in 2001. Wasu stated he then adapted the play into a 500-page book which he was unable to get published. Frustrated Wasu decided to adapt the work into a film, which he would then produce himself in order to maintain total control over the project. Wasu has been secretive about exactly how he obtained the funding for the project, but he did tell Entertainment Weekly that he made some of the money by importing leather jackets from Korea. According to Sestero in his book The Disaster Artist, Wisu was already independently wealthy at the time production began having amassed a fortune over several years of entrepreneurship and real estate development in and around Los Angeles and San Francisco. The budget for the room reached all of which was spent on production and marketing. Wisu has stated that the reason the film was relatively expensive was because many members of the cast and crew had to be replaced and each of the cast members had several understudies. According to Sestero, Wisu made numerous poor decisions during filming that unnecessarily inflated the film's budget, such as building sets for sequences that could have been filmed on location, 
purchasing unnecessary equipment and filming identical scenes multiple times using different sets. Sestero further wrote that the film's budget skyrocketed as a result of minutes-long dialogue sequences taking hours or days to shoot due to Wiseau's inability to properly remember his lines or move to the appropriate place on camera. According to Sestero and Greg Ellery, Wiseau came to the Burns and Sawyer film lot rented a studio and bought a complete beginning director package which included the purchase of two brand new film and HD cameras. Wisu confused about the differences between 35mm film and high-definition video, decided to shoot the entire film in both formats simultaneously, using a custom-built apparatus that housed both cameras side by side and required two crews to operate. Commenting on his decision to shoot the film in this way, Wisu said that he wanted to be able to say that he was the first director to film an entire movie simultaneously in two formats, although ultimately only the 35mm footage was used in the final edit. Casting Wisu has said that while casting the film he selected his group of actors from among thousands of headshots, yet nearly the entire cast of the room and had never before been in a full-length film. For example, The Room was the first film in which Carolyn Minot had ever appeared. Greg Sestero, who had known Wisu for some time before production began had limited film experience, and had only agreed to work with Wisu as part of the production crew. On the first day of filming Wisu fired the actor originally hired to play Mark, and Sestero agreed to fill in. He would later admit to being uncomfortable filming his sex scenes. Because of this he was allowed to keep his jeans on while shooting them. According to Greg Ellery, Juliet Danielle was just off the bus from Texas when shooting began. And that on the first day of shooting the cast watched in horror as Wasu jumped on Danielle. And immediately began filming the love scene. Sestero has disputed this chronology stating that the sex scenes were among the last to be filmed. Wisu has said that Danielle was originally one of three or four understudies for the Lisa character and was selected after the original actress left the production. According to Danielle, the original actress cast to play Lisa was closer in age to Wisu and had an accent Danielle described as random. For Sestero, the actress was Latina and came from an unidentified South American country. Danielle stated that she had originally been cast as Michelle but was given the role of Lisa when the original actress was dismissed from the production because her personality didn't seem to fit the character. Danielle further corroborates that multiple actors were dismissed from the production prior to filming including another actress hired to play Michelle. Kyle Vogt, who played Peter, told the production team at the outset of filming that he only had a limited amount of time to dedicate to the project. Not all of his scenes were filmed by the time his schedule ran out, and he left the production despite the fact that Peter was to play a pivotal role in the then unrecorded climax. His lines in the last half of the film were given to Ellery, whose character is never introduced explained or addressed by name. Script The original script was significantly longer than the one used during filming, and featured a series of lengthy monologues. It was edited on set by the cast and script supervisor who found much of the dialogue incomprehensible. Speaking to Entertainment Weekly, one anonymous cast member commented that the script contained stuff that was just unsayable. I know it's hard to imagine there was stuff that was worse. But there was. Sestero mentions that Wisu was adamant characters say their lines the way they were written, but that several cast members managed to slip in ad-libs that ended up in the final cut of the film. Sestero recalls in his book The Disaster Artist that Wisu intended for the film 
to contain a subplot in which Johnny was revealed to be a vampire due to Wiseau's own fascination with the creatures. Sestero recounts how at the outset of production, Wisu tasked members of the crew with figuring out a way to execute a sequence in which Johnny's Mercedes-Benz would lift off from the roof of the townhouse and fly across the San Francisco skyline revealing Johnny's vampiric nature. Wisu eventually decided to drop the subplot after learning that there was no practical way to film the flying car scene on the production's budget. The script is characterized by numerous inexplicable mood and personality shifts in characters. In analyzing the film's abrupt tone shifts, Ruxestero highlighted two scenes in particular. In the first scene, Johnny enters the rooftop in the middle of a tirade about being accused of domestic abuse only to become abruptly cheerful upon seeing Mark. A few moments later, he laughs inappropriately upon learning that a friend of Mark's had been severely beaten. On set, Sestero and first assistant director Sandy Schler repeatedly tried to convince Wisu that the line should not be delivered as comical but Wisu refused to refrain from laughing. In the second instance occurring a few scenes later Mark attempts to kill Peter by throwing him off a roof after Peter expresses his belief that Mark is having an affair with Lisa. Just as Peter is about to fall to his death Mark pulls Peter back over the edge of the roof apologizes and the two continue their previous conversation with no acknowledgement of what just occurred. Much of the dialogue is repetitive, especially that of Johnny, whose speech is partially composed of a series of catchphrases. He begins almost every conversation in the film with a salutation oh hi, and ends most conversations by saying that's the idea. Many of the principal characters use the phrase don't worry about it to dismissively end conversations and Lisa often ends discussions about Johnny by saying, I don't want to talk about it. Almost every male character in the film has dialogue discussing Lisa's physical attractiveness, including an unnamed friend of Johnny's whose only line of dialogue in the film is, Lisa looks hot tonight. Despite the significant amount of dialogue regarding Johnny, and Lisa's forthcoming wedding no character ever uses the words fiancé or fiancé only referring to Johnny as Lisa's future husband or Lisa as Johnny's future wife. Filming Principal photography lasted six months. It was mainly shot on a Los Angeles soundstage, but some second unit shooting was done in San Francisco, California. The film's many rooftop sequences were shot on the soundstage, with exteriors of San Francisco later green-screened in. A behind-the-scenes feature shows that some of the roof scenes were shot in August 2002. The film employed over 400 people and Wisu is credited as an actor and executive producer, the writer, producer and director. Two others, Chloe Lietzky and Drew Caffrey, are credited as executive producers but according to Sestero, Lietzky had no involvement in the film and Caffrey had died years prior to filming. Wizu had a number of problems with his behind-the-camera team and replaced the entire crew twice, though he later said that they were replaced four times. Some people had multiple jobs on the film, for example in addition to playing the role of Mark. Sestero also worked as a line producer assistant to Tommy Wisu and helped with casting. Wisu frequently forgot his own lines and miscues requiring numerous retakes and on-set direction from the script supervisor. As a result, much of his dialogue had to be redubbed in post-production soundtrack. The score was written by Loyola Marymount University music professor Millard and Milicevic. Milicevic went on to do the score to Wisso's 2004 documentary Homeless in America, and was later hired to do the score on the 2016 documentary on the room Roomful of Spoons. 
The soundtrack features 4R. The songs are I Will by Jara, Gibson Crazy by Clint Gamboa, Baby You and Me by Gamboa, with Belle Johnson, and You're My Rose by Kitra Williams, is also reprised during the end credits. The soundtrack was released by Wissos TPW Records on July 27, 2003. Gamboa later appeared as a semi-finalist on the 10th season of American Idol. Directorial Credit Dispute In a February 18, 2011, Entertainment Weekly article, veteran script supervisor Sandy Schler announced that he desires credit for directing The Room. Schler told EW shortly after being hired on a script supervisor Wasu became too engrossed with his acting duties to direct the film properly, according to Schler, Wasu then asked him to tell the actors what to do and yell, action, and cut, and tell the cameraman what shots to get. The script supervisor also said that he had a conversation with Wasu in which he refused to give up the title of director but asked Schler to direct his movie. The story is corroborated by at least one of the film's actors who requested anonymity. For the story, Wisu has dismissed Schler's comments. Greg Sestira's memoir The Disaster Artist about the making of The Room partially corroborates Schler's version of events, describing him taking charge of numerous sequences in which Wisu found himself unable to remember lines properly or adequately interact with the rest of the cast, but jokes that claiming directorial credit was like claiming to have been the Hindenburg's principal aeronautics engineer, Wasu said of Schler's assertion, well this is so laughable that, you know what, I don't know, probably only in America it can happen, this kind of stuff. Influences the basic premise of The Room draws on specific incidents from Wiseau's own life, including the details of how Johnny came to San Francisco and met Lisa and the nature of Johnny and Mark's friendship. According to Greg Sestero, the character of Lisa is based on a woman to whom Wiseau once proposed with a diamond engagement ring but who betrayed him several times, resulting in the breakup of their relationship. Sestero further postulates that Wasu based Lisa's explicit conniving on the character Tom Ripley. After Wasu had a profound emotional reaction to the film The Talented Mr. Ripley, and matches elements of its three main characters to those in the room, Sestero has likewise indicated that the character Mark was named for the Ripley actor Matt Damon, whose first name Wasu had misheard. Wisu also drew on the chamber plays of Tennessee Williams, whose highly emotional scenes he enjoyed acting out in drama school many advertising materials. For the room make explicit parallels to Williams' work. In his performance Wisu attempted to emulate Marlon Brando and James Dean and went as far to directly use quotes. From their films The Line You Are Tearing Me Apart was taken from Dean's Rebel Without a Cause. Promotion The film was promoted almost exclusively through a single billboard in Hollywood, located on Highland Avenue just north of Fountain featuring an image Wisu refers to as Evil Man, an extreme close-up of his own face with one eye in mid-blink although more conventional artwork was created for the film, featuring the main character's faces emblazoned over the Golden Gate Bridge with Su Chosi. Evil Man for what he regarded as its provocative quality around the time of the film's release. The image led many passers-by to believe that the room was a horror film. Wisu also paid for a small television and print campaign in and around Los Angeles with taglines calling The Room, a film with the passion of Tennessee Williams. Despite the film's failure to enjoy immediate success, Wisu paid to keep the billboard up for over five years, at the cost of a month. Its bizarre imagery and longevity led to it becoming a minor tourist attraction. When asked how he managed to afford 
to keep the billboard up for so long in such a prominent location Wasu responded, well, we like the location and we like the billboard, so we feel that people should see the room. We are selling DVDs which are selling okay. Critical Reception The Room premiered on June 27, 2003 at the Lamley Fairfax and Fallbrook Theatres in Los Angeles. Wasu additionally arranged a screening for the cast and the press at one of the venues, renting a spotlight to sit in front of the theatre and arriving in a limousine. Ticket buyers were given a free copy of the film's soundtrack on CD. Although actress Robin Paris described the audience laughing at the film, Variety reporter Scott Founders who was also in attendance would later write that the film prompted most of its viewers to ask for their money back before even 30 minutes had passed. IFC.com described Weso's speaking voice in the film as Borat trying to do an impression of Christopher Walken playing a mental patient. The Guardian described the film as a mix of Tennessee Williams' Edward R. Kelly's Trapped in the Closet. The Room has been criticized for its acting screenplay dialogue, production values score direction and cinematography. In 2017, the film had a score of 32% on Rotten Tomatoes based on 22 reviews with an average rating of 3.3 out of 10. The critical consensus states, a bona fide classic of midnight cinema, Tommy Wiseau's misguided masterpiece subverts the rules of filmmaking, with a boundless enthusiasm that renders such mundanities as acting, screenwriting, and cinematography utterly irrelevant. You will never see a football the same way again. In 2013, the Atlantic's Adam Rosen wrote an article in entitled, Should Gloriously Terrible Movies Like The Room Be Considered Outsider Art? Where he made the argument the label, of outsider art, has traditionally applied to painters and sculptors, but it's hard to see why it couldn't also refer to Wisu or any other thwarted, unself-aware filmmaker. Midnight Circuit the Room played in the Lamley Fairfax and Fallbrook for the next two weeks, grossing a total of before it was pulled from circulation. Toward the end of its run, the Lamley Fairfax Theatre displayed two signs on the inside of the ticket window in relation to the film, one that read no refunds and another citing a blurb from an early review. This film is like being stabbed in the head. During one showing in the second week of its run, one of the few audience members in attendance was Five Second Films' Michael Ruslett, who found unintentional humor in the film's poor dialogue and production values. After treating the screening as his own private mystery science theater, Ruslett began encouraging friends to join him for future showings to mock the film starting a word-of-mouth campaign that resulted in about 100 attending the film's final screening. Ruslett and his friends saw the film four times in three days, and it was in these initial screenings that many of the room traditions were born, such as the throwing of spoons and footballs during the film. After the film was pulled from theaters, those who had attended the final showing began emailing Wizu telling him how much they had 
enjoyed the film. Encouraged by the volume of messages he received, Wasu booked a single midnight screening of The Room in June 2004, which proved successful enough that Wasu booked a second showing in July and a third in August. Celebrity fans of the film included Paul Rudd, David Crosswell, Arnett Patton, Oswald, Tim Heidecker, Eric Wareheim, Seth Rogen, and James and Dave Franco. Kristen Bell acquired a film reel and hosted private viewing parties. Veronica Mars creator Rob Thomas would also slip references into episodes of Mars as much as possible. The film eventually developed national and international cult status with Wisu arranging screenings around the United States and in Canada, Scandinavia, the United Kingdom, Australia and New Zealand. The film had regular showings in many theatres worldwide with many as a monthly event. Fans interact with the film in a similar fashion to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Audience members dress up as their favourite characters throw plastic spoons, toss footballs, to each other from short distances, and yell insulting comments about the quality of the film as well as lines from the film itself. Home Media In December 2005 The Room was released on DVD and then Blu-ray in December 2012. It is available for rental at select video rental shops as well as purchase via direct distribution from Wisu Films, Netflix and Amazon.com. The DVD's special features include an interview with Wisu who is asked questions by an off-screen Greg Sestero. Wisu sits directly in front of a fireplace with a mantle cluttered by various props. From the film, next to him sits a large framed theatrical poster for the film. A few of Wiseau's answers are dubbed in, although it is evident that the dubbed responses match what he was originally saying. Wiseau fails to answer several of the questions instead offering non-sequiturs. Among the outtakes included on the Blu-ray is an alternate version of the Chris R. scene. Set in a back alley, instead of tossing a football Denny is playing basketball and attempts to get the drug dealer to shoot some HORSE with him to distract him from the debt. Another bonus feature on the Blu-ray is a more than half-hour long fly on the wall-style documentary about the making of the room. The documentary includes no narration, very little dialogue, only one interview, and consists largely of clips of the crew preparing to shoot. Wisu announced plans in April 2011 for a 3D version of the film scanned from the 35mm film of The Room. In 2018 Greg Sestero and Tommy Wisu will reunite in a comedy thriller entitled Best Fiends. Book In June 2011 it was announced that Greg Sestero signed a book deal with Simon to write a book based on his experiences making the film. The book, titled The Disaster Artist, was published in October 2013. A film adaptation of The Disaster Artist was announced in February 2014 produced by Seth Rogen and scheduled to be directed by James Franco. Franco stated The Disaster Artist was a combination of Boogie Nights and The Master. The film will star Franco as Wisu, his brother Dave Franco as Sestero and be written by The Fault in Our Stars screenwriters Scott Neustatter and Michael H. Weber. On October 15, 2015, it was announced Seth Rogen would play a role, and cinematographer Brandon Trost would serve as the DP for the disaster artist. On October 29, 2015 it was announced that Warner Brothers and New Line Cinema would distribute The Disaster Artist. Shooting began December 7, 2015. A work-in-progress version was screened at South by Southwest in March 2017 with the wide release set on December 8, 2017. Video Game in September 2010 Newgrounds owner Tom Fulp released a Flash game tribute in the form of a 16-bit styled adventure game played entirely from Johnny's point of view. 
The game's artwork was provided by staff member Jeff Johnny Utah Bandolin with music transcribed by animator Chris O'Neill from the Maladon Milicevic score and soundtrack. Live performances On June 10, 2011, the AFI Silver Theatre and Cultural Center presented a live play, reading based on the original script for the movie. Wasu reprised his role of Johnny and was joined by Greg Sestero playing the role of Mark. In 2011 Wasu mentioned plans for a Broadway adaptation of the film, in which he would appear only on opening night, it will be similar to what you see in the movie. Except it will be musical, as well as you will see, like for example Johnny. We could have maybe 10 Johnnies at the same time singing or playing football. So the decision have to be made at the time when we actually doing choreography cause I'll be doing choreography as well I'll be in it only one time that's it as Johnny. He mentioned the plans again during a 2015 Q web series. On October 21, 2014 cast member Robin Paris launched a Kickstarter campaign to raise a budget for her comedy mockumentary web series The Room Actors, Where Are They Now? A mockumentary, on completion the campaign had raised from 385 backers. Although a number of the original cast are to appear in the series with Sue Sestero and Holmes are not involved. The series premiered at the 24th Rain Dance Film Festival on September 30, 2016 and is due for full release in 2017. In popular culture The comedy show Tim and Eric Awesome Show Great Job on Adult Swim featured Wasu prominently on a March 9, 2009 episode titled Tommy. Recruited as a guest director, Wisu is interviewed in mockumentary style along with the show's leading actors. During the production of a fake film titled The Pig Man, two scenes from the room are featured. During the episode, Adult Swim has broadcast the movie three times from 2009 to 2011 as part of their April Fool's Day programming. In 2012, they showed the first 20 seconds of it before switching to Toonami for the remainder of the night. On June 18, 2009 a riff tracks for The Room was released featuring commentary by Michael J. Nelson, Bill Corbett and Kevin Murphy formerly of Mystery Science Theatre 3000. This was followed up with a live theatre show by Riff Tracks on May 6, 2015 which was shown in 700 theatres across the U.S and Canada. The show screened once more on January 28, 2016 as part of the Best of Riff Tracks live series. On his 2009 DVD My Weakness is Strong, comedian Patton Oswalt parodied The Room with a fake infomercial. The spoof also features a cameo from John Hamm. In 2010 the film was mocked on the internet comedy series Nostalgia Critic which highlighted the film's bad acting and writing but encouraged viewers to see the movie. It truly is one of those films you have to see to believe. The episode was taken down following claims of copyright infringement from Wisu Films. It was replaced by a short video titled The Tommy Y Show in which host Doug Walker, dressed as Wisu, mocked the threatened legal actions. The main review was later reinstated. Sestero later made a cameo appearance on the Nostalgia Critic episode Dawn of the Commercials, reprising his role of Mark. Both Wisu and Sestero appeared in separate episodes on Walker's talk show Shut Up and Talk. In Wisu's 2014 sitcom pilot The Neighbors the character Troy watches the room in a scene. In 2015 Sestero starred in five second films feature Dude Bro Party Massacre 3 directed by Michael Ruslet, the patient hero of the room cult movement. The Sunday July 5, 2015, installment of Amy Dickinson's advice column Ask Amy unwittingly featured a hoax letter that derived its situational premise from the room and even after being edited for publication 
retained phrases from the film's dialogue. Dickinson addressed the hoax in the following Saturday's edition of the National Public Radio comedy and quiz show Wait Wait, Don't Tell Me, and her July 20, 2015 column. Brought to you by Wikivd.com. Would you like to know more?